Okay, so this is our second podcast of Unit 3. Still talking about the periodic table. Now we're going to get into the meat of this unit, the trends. What's going to be most of your test is these kind of patterns of the periodic table. We're focusing on three for today on pages four, five, and six, and we'll get the rest of them next time. Um, when I say we're working on page four, it's really just that last little bit of page four, and then we're going to finish out five and six together. So these definitions, even though it's just a little bit at the bottom of page four, super duper important because this is the reason why everything else happens. So nuclear charge is exactly what it sounds like, the charge of the nucleus. And in, this is going to be equal to the number of protons in our nucleus because the nucleus has protons and neutrons, but neutrons don't have any charge, so they don't contribute to the nuclear charge. Now, this generally increases from going from the left to the right in the rows of the periodic table. And you can tell because the atomic number increases from left to right in the periodic table. And as we know, the p atomic number is equal to the number of protons. Now, you might think that this also increases as we move down the periodic table in a column as well, because the atomic number does increase as we go down, but we're about to see how this shielding effect actually cancels that out. So, uh, shielding is the effect caused by inner energy levels of electrons canceling out part of the nuclear charge for the outer electrons. They're literally protecting them, shielding them, canceling out some of that nuclear charge. And I actually want to take a second to show you this, but as you might expect, shielding does increase as we go down the columns of the periodic table, because each of those rows adds an extra energy level around my atom, and that's an extra level of shielding. So let's see that in a couple of quick, simple examples. Here I just have two simple elements that are in the same column, hydrogen and lithium. Hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus, lithium has three. They each have a corresponding number of electrons around the outside. If we looked at the just plain old nuclear charge, as you can see, one proton in the nucleus means hydrogen has a nuclear charge of one. Lithium has a nuclear charge of three. Pretty straightforward. Now, this hydrogen electron is in the first energy level, which means there is nothing in between it and the nucleus, which means it will always feel the full nuclear charge that the nucleus has to offer. So the second row, I said called it the effective nuclear charge. That's still going to be one for hydrogen. Over here with lithium, because I have three electrons and they're on two different energy levels, these two electrons in the first energy level form this barrier of negative charge. And because there's two electrons there, that's kind of a negative two shell. So as this positive three charge from the nucleus is trying to reach out to that outermost electron, that outermost electron really only feels one proton pulling on it. The other two have been canceled out by those two inner electrons that are forming that barrier there. They're just moving so fast, it's like a shell of negative charge. So this effective nuclear charge is the actual kind of charge that the electrons feel, and that's going to be the same as we move down the column, because those that added shielding, uh, even as we get more protons, there's going to be more electrons protecting them. But on the same row, that's like adding more electrons on the same energy level. There's no extra shielding in there if we're going across the row. So back to what we had just been saying. Make sure that we've got this down. These are two really, really important facts. And like I said, the rows, everything that we see change is going to come back to the nuclear charge. If that row is what's changing, and if we're moving up and down in a column on the periodic table and we're asking why a certain trend is what it is, it's because of the shielding. So these are our two reasons why everything happens. Main group elements is just another word that you're going to hear us use a lot. Um, this includes the S and P block elements. They're also known as group A elements because above each of the columns is a little number and then an A after it. Those are the main group elements, and those are the ones that we're going to be focusing on for these trends. We're not really going to pay much attention to the transition elements. In fact, I'm going to skip over a couple of places that it mentions them in the packet because we are never, ever, ever going to ask you 
to predict some of their kind of weird charges. We're just going to assume they follow all the same rules as every other element. So, our first trend, atomic radii, or singular atomic radius. Now, the textbook will tell you that an atomic radius is the average distance from the center of an atom to the edge of the electron cloud, which is true, but really, when we talk about atomic radius, we're just trying to talk about the size of the atom, how big or small it is. Now, for those of you who are curious, how do you measure the size of an atom? There must be a really tiny ruler. Well, we can't really use a ruler. We can't really see the edge of that electron cloud. We have to bond two identical nuclei together, two identical atoms, and measure the distance between the solid nuclei and divide that in half. But, you know, don't have to write that down at all. So, atomic radius trends. The periodic trends, meaning in a period or row, of the periodic table. Remember, the nuclear charge is increasing steadily as I go across that row. So I'm getting a stronger and stronger magnet in the center of my atom. And because that nuclear charge is pulling harder on the same energy level of electrons, that's going to pull them in closer to the nucleus, causing the atomic radius to decrease. In a group, Remember, as we're moving down a group, the shielding is increasing. We're adding extra energy levels, and those energy levels are bigger and bigger, and so our atom is going to be getting bigger and bigger. That atomic radius is going to be increasing as we go down a column. Now we're going to skip over those practice problems for just a second, because I want to summarize this trend while it's still fresh. Although I don't really like this little periodic table thing that they put here for it. Uh, mostly because the arrows always point in the same directions, but they kind of get bigger and smaller to try and show you, oh, this is getting bigger as it moves down, and this is getting smaller. But I like to draw my arrows pointing towards the bigger things. So I'm going to actually draw my own little mini periodic table here. Just, even just a box would be fine. And then I am going to draw arrows towards where the largest atomic radiuses are. So we said that the atomic radius decreases as I move from left to right, which means that my largest atomic radius are going to be at the left. We also said that the atomic radius would increase as I move down a column because we're adding energy levels. So that arrow is going to point down. And the reason that I like these arrows better than these arrows is because altogether these are pointing me to an element. Whichever element is sitting down here in this far corner has the largest atomic radius of the entire periodic table, and that's francium. So if we remember francium has the biggest atomic radius, then we can answer all of those questions and problems about which ones are larger by understanding that the closer to francium I am, the larger the atomic radius is. Or, shortening that down, the closer to FR, the larger the AR. Kind of mirror each other there. So, let's use that to work some problems. I've gone ahead and highlighted some elements in my periodic table, just so that those of you without periodic tables can follow along still. And when I'm looking at these two elements for part A, I just have to look at where they are. It asks me to circle or select which one is larger larger is closer to FR. So that's going to mean that my answer is SR. In my next example, I have NA and RB, which are both in the same column. And the larger one is always going to be the one that's closer to FR. So that's going to be RB. It really is that simple. Sometimes, though, we're going to ask you to order these in increasing size. And I think that this label got a little bit off in kind of a weird spot, but these next A, B, C bits we wanted to arrange in increasing size. And one quick note about this, increasing, a lot of us think, oh, increasing, getting bigger. So I want to start with the biggest one, but increasing means I need to start from the small ones, and increase means I need to get bigger and bigger. So I'm going to actually order these from small to big because this is increasing here. Now, let's find those elements wherever they are. There they are. So my smallest one is going to be the one farthest from francium. So in this case that's going to be fluorine. And then getting a little bit closer on the same row is nitrogen. 
and then even closer going down a few rows is arsenic. Our next set of three elements, if we look in the periodic table, all three of these are all in the same column. And so this should be pretty easy to or order them in increasing size. Remember that I'm looking for small to big when I'm increasing. And my smallest one is the farthest away from francium. And then a little bit closer. And then, oh my gosh, these were in the exact same order. It could be that easy. Last question I'm going to leave for you. I will help you all find these elements. They're all in the same row. Remember to put them in increasing size, meaning smallest to biggest, and they are not already in the correct order. Just, you know, FYI in case you were wondering. Now, ionic radii are almost the exact same thing. It's just instead of talking about the size of an atom, we're talking about the size of an ion, which is just an atom that's gained or lost electrons. And this couldn't be simpler. We even don't even need a periodic table because we're not going to compare different elements. We're going to compare a single element to its ion or ions. So if we think about cations, remember cations are positive ions. They tend to be metals. And they've become positive because they've lost electrons. That means they're getting smaller. So if they're losing weight, they're getting smaller. It's just like losing electrons. And so when we look at calcium turning into calcium plus two, they lost two electrons. If the question asked which one's smaller, that would be calcium plus two. If they asked which one's bigger, that'd be calcium. So we just need to make sure that we still remember and understand how these ions are formed. And remember this vocab, cation and anion, very important words. Anions are the opposite. They're negative, tend to be nonmetals. They've gained electrons to make them negative, which means they've gained weight. They've gotten larger, bigger. Nitrogen's gained three electrons when it turns into N negative three. So N negative three is bigger. If we wanted to summarize this trend, more negativity makes us larger, more positivity makes us smaller. Now there's a little kind of side note I'm going to add to that once we start on those practice problems, but wanted to get that down first. So this asks us which particle is larger in radius. So larger means I'm looking for the one that is more negative. And that's pretty easy in the first one. More negative, larger. But my second one, it's all positive. So I can't, none of them are negative. It's hard to tell, maybe. But remember, more negative means that it's less positive. So if I think about it that way, which of these ions is less positive? Oh. Well, that's the Fe plus 2 instead of the Fe plus 3. So that's what we need to kind of connect here. I'm going to have you try this next one. We can check it in class together if you'd like. And I want to talk about this silver problem because it doesn't tell you what the charge is. And silver is a transition metal, so you can't predict the charge. So how are we even supposed to answer this question? Well, I kind of just gave you a hint. Silver is a transition metal. And like we said earlier, metals tend to form cations. They tend to form positive ions. So even though I'm not even quite sure, well, I mean, I am, but you're not even quite sure how positive it should be, because silver is a metal, you know it will be positive. And that on its own means it's lost electrons and that a neutral, normal, just plain silver atom would be larger. So those are our ionic radii, and we're going to jump over and finish with this ion idea. Uh, ionization energy is the energy required to ionize an atom or remove an electron from an atom. Uh, you see an equation here um, just kind of showing you that energy has to be put into our reaction. It's on the reactant side before the arrow uh, in order to make these things happen. Um, we can write out this equation. I'm never going to ask you to write out one of these equations, so don't worry about that too much. Let's focus on the trends. Periodic trends, remember, are rows, and nuclear charge is the major change in my atom. And my atom is getting a larger and larger magnet in the middle of it, and that pulling harder on those electrons. So is it going to be easier or harder to pull an electron off of this atom? Well, with a stronger magnet, you're going to have to pull harder and put more work in, more energy, 
in order to remove those electrons. So this ionization energy is going to increase. In our group, moving down a column, shielding is what's changing. Our electrons are getting farther and farther from the nucleus with more energy levels protecting them. So with less of a pull, it's going to have less of that effective nuclear charge like that lithium we looked at earlier, then those electrons on the outside aren't going to be held on to quite as strongly. And that means that it's going to be easier to pull them off away from that atom and it's going to have a lower energy. The, elect the ionization energy is going to decrease as we move down a column. So let's summarize this trend just like we did before, before we work out any problems, because I think this will help us. And you could draw your arrows there. I just don't really like the way that that bit of the periodic table looks, honestly. So I drew out my own. And as we move from left to right, this time we said that the ionization energy was increasing. So we are going to draw an arrow pointing to the right. But we said as we move down a group, the ionization energy would decrease. So our biggest ionization energies are going to be at the top of any given group. Putting these arrows together, helium is our largest ionization energy. So the closer we get to HE, the larger the IE gets. So let's put it into practice. Which has the lower first ionization energy? Well, I'm not even going to circle any results because once we see them, you basically know. We're looking for lower ionization energy, so I want it to be farther from HE. So in this case, it's going to be nitrogen. In this case, it's going to be fluorine, chlorine, arsenic, and I'll leave this one for you, although I'm pretty sure you can answer it just as quickly. Just circle one last element. Now, one last quick little note here. We form ions and by removing an electron, but we can remove more than one electron. So what we're talking about right here is really the first ionization energy. And once we keep removing electrons until we get to that noble gas configuration, after that, there's an incredibly large amount of energy needed to remove another electron. If we look at magnesium as an example, uh, when magnesium turns into magnesium plus one, it takes a little over 700 kilojoules of energy. When magnesium plus one turns into magnesium plus two, it takes twice as much energy, which I guess is a lot, and yeah, sure, it's more. But when you try and start turning magnesium plus two to magnesium plus three, it doesn't want to go any farther than that. It only had two valence electrons. That's what it wants to lose to get stable. So after it loses that second valence electron, if you try and take off a third, it's going to take 10 times as much energy as that first electron took. And it's only going to keep getting bigger and bigger. So just atoms and ions take energy to make this happen, but they, they have a less, a lower ionization energy uh, to help them get to that kind of configuration they want. And then it's super big after they get done with that. So that's it. End of podcast. See you in class.